good morning gang. The coffee's a brewing. I got the stove firing up. I'm gonna make some eggs. I think for me only after the other day. Somebody got sick. And uh, and then I'm gonna start the vlog. Well, good morning my friends. It's your old pal Jordan the Lion. Well, breakfast is done. I've cleaned up all the dishes. And now I'm gonna go out and do some vlogging with my grandpa. He was actually telling me a story about something on the outskirts of town and I read up on it and I said, yeah, I'd like to swing by there. As well as something else we were talking about last night, something pretty historical when it comes to the world of football. I really didn't realize how much of the firsts Dayton was responsible for. One of them being that Dayton actually had the very first NFL football team called the Dayton Triangles. And when he started telling me that, then he was telling me other stories about people from the area. And there's somebody that's actually buried in a cemetery with my great grandparents and my great, my grandpa's brother. So my grandpa's brother actually has a pretty interesting story too that I think is worth mentioning. So we're gonna go visit them all in the cemetery today. Then we're gonna go to Troy. We're gonna eat in what is kind of known as maybe the most famous eatery in Troy called Kay's Hamburger Shop. And then we're gonna go visit my mom. And then I don't know what's gonna happen after that. So Days of Jordan the Lion begins now. Well, I got my wish. I was notified today by my grandpa. He said, tomorrow I'm making the pork and sauerkraut for you. So he makes the best. He, his mother made great pork and sauerkraut and he's great at it. And every time I'm here, I have it. And one of the times, the first time he ever made it for me, he didn't think I'd actually enjoy it or want it or anything, but he made it anyway. And then I loved it so much that I asked him if he'd make it one more time before I left and he did. So I actually got it twice that time. And he's already thawing out the pork. I have to take this guy out vlogging too. Look at that barn. Oh wow, look at this. We saw this from, uh, from an intersection. They carve those trees into, uh, you can see a couple of bald eagles. That looks like a hawk. Look at that. Awesome. We were just turning around in this driveway and I noticed that there's a, a mural painted on the side of that barn that says Miami County 1807 to 2007. Well, right off there in the distance, you can see that old brick building. That's actually our first stop of the day. Now this is pretty cool. This was something my grandpa actually told me about because when I grew up, it was kind of a, it was kind of an odd thing because if you were in Troy, we had, um, like when I went to school, there were, you know, quite a few Asian Americans, white Americans, African Americans. It was pretty much, it ran the gamut. But outside of that, outside of like the main cities, you really don't see many African Americans out here. And he was telling me that for a hundred years, right here on this plot of land was actually, it was actually a farm. Well, it was a community. It was called Marshalltown. And Marshalltown was, it was four freed slaves had made their way out here and a couple named John and Sarah Marshall sold them this plot of land so that they could build a whole new life, a whole new community. And one of the interesting things was that my grandpa said, you know, the old schoolhouse, the old, it was called the colored schoolhouse back then. We looked it up on, uh, on the website for the town out here on their historical sites and everything. And that was what it was called. It was called the colored schoolhouse and it was a one room schoolhouse. And he said that it was basically four families started this and it lasted for a hundred years. And basically what ended up happening was they got their community going and people would eventually move away or whatnot. And there was one last remaining person who was in the lineage that lived in this and still operated the farm out here. And his name was Jacob Young. And he was apparently a pretty colorful character because I found a pretty interesting uh, little article about him and how he was stating and trying to prove that he was a member of the Randolph family who was some of the original settlers here. Now, you can see that they're in the process of demolishing it or something, but this is the, uh, this would have been here since 1849, I believe, until the 1950s. And Jacob Young actually was, uh, as my grandpa said, 
he was the last one to live out here on this farm and he actually died because he was uh, he was traveling to Troy and a, uh, a car full of kids that weren't really paying attention I guess they were talking or whatnot they ran a stop sign and uh, and they accidentally killed him I don't know who owns the farm now but uh, my grandpa was looking a little deeper and one of the things he said he found was that when this was in operation that the the men that were the teachers here made $38 a year and the women made $24 a year. So let's go see if we can get in over here on this side, maybe walk around a little bit. I don't know how, uh, how safe the floors are because you can see it's kind of broken down through, but I figure if a big old truck like that's in there, it's probably not too bad. Let's take a look. Wooden frames. I guess we're doing an urban exploration uh, day today. Yeah, we can get in here. Or at least test it out. Makes you wonder how they... Makes you wonder how they got this guy in here. There's a door frame. And I'll post a picture of, uh, of Jacob Young. In the article about Jacob Young, they said that he prided himself on being considered the champion debater of Possum Hollow. Possum Hollow was kind of one of the outskirts little communities of, of people out here. And they actually named part of their farm the Randolph Farm because they were they were part of the Randolph slaves when they were freed, and so they still kept that name. Look, that's part of a, looks like an old desk or an old uh, back of a chair. You can see where the, the building is actually splitting apart right up in there. 1847. Think about that. Whew. All right, let's get out of here. We're going to go to our next stop. Look, there's part of the uh, the frame of the the doorway right there, or I mean the window. See? Actually, it was probably that one right there. I'm glad he told me about that. It's pretty fascinating. And right straight out there was the old shack that Jacob Young lived in when he died. West Milton. We just saw this historical marker, so I felt like reading it. It says, Charles Furness, 1908 West Milton native, Charles Furness worked as a machinist in Dayton doing odd jobs for the Wright brothers. Inventors of the first practical airplane. At the time, the U.S. Army had agreed to purchase an aircraft from the Wright brothers, provided it would carry a pilot and passenger. Furness worked with the brothers to adapt their plane. 1908, he flew first with Wilbur and then Orville becoming the world's first airplane passenger. Awesome. And then it actually continues on to the other side, you can see, and it says, following the test flights in 1908, the Wright brothers engaged Charles Furness full time. As the first person hired to build airplanes, he was the first employee in what would become an aerospace industry. He worked with Orville and Wilbur to develop Signal Corps No. 1, America's first military aircraft in the beginning of the U.S. Air Force. He left employment with the Wright brothers to start a garage in West Milton, but remained friends. Orville attended his funeral in 1941. So this was his house. It's now a funeral home. Now this is actually who we came out here to see today. A man named Carl Brumbaugh. My grandpa started telling me this story and I said, once again, here he goes. I had all these vlogs planned and he presents something this awesome right in front of me. My grandpa got a gift from his sister and 
the gift was a book on the history of Dayton sports, and they mentioned Carl Brumbaugh. And Carl Brumbaugh was the quarterback here in West Milton, of course, and my grandpa said he had an offensive lineman by the name of Edwin Cress, and I first I thought, oh wow, one of our relatives, and then all of a sudden I remembered, I said, that's great grandpa. So we both got a kick out of that and started laughing, and when I started reading up, Carl Brumbaugh actually played at West Milton, went on to play at Ohio State. He then, from there, went on to play at the University of Florida for the Gators and was part of what was called the um, Phantom Backfield, the Phantom Four Backfield. And um, that was like in 1928, I believe, and is actually in the University of Florida's Football Hall of Fame. But why he's really interesting to me is that he ended up playing with Red Grange for nine seasons in the 30s for the Chicago Bears when George Hallis was the coach of the Bears. When basically, as my grandpa said, George Hallis kind of put the NFL on the map, made it more legitimate and came up with kind of the, the style that's played today. And Carl Brumbaugh right here was the very first quarterback to play quarterback in the T formation that is now the standard. When I started looking into it, it said that he went on to play for the Rams, and oddly, it said the Brooklyn Dodgers. So I actually was like, what did he switch over to, to baseball in 1937? My grandpa said, no, the Brooklyn Dodgers were a football team as well. So Carl Brumbaugh had nine seasons in the NFL, and then when he came out, he actually became a... Uh, a commentator for the University of Dayton. He also was a coach for a while and then died really young. You can see right here, he died at the age of 63. And uh, I was kind of confused by that. My grandpa said that he, he had heard and I believe he had seen him after his after his football career and after the days of when he was a UD, calling play by play for UD and he said he had become a pretty heavy drunk or had a pretty bad drinking problem, and that was pretty much what sealed his fate. But like I said, when he had told me that football started around here, and then I hear the very first quarterback to ever, <laughs> to ever play in the T formation, and what's also pretty interesting is that Carl led the Bears to two championships and actually played for a third. And like I said, when I, when I looked him up on uh, just Google, the first picture that popped up was him holding a football for Red Grange to kick. And he played with uh, Red Grange and, um, and Nagurski. So if you are a football fanatic and know anything about the early days of the Bears, those classic um, dominant Bears teams with George Hallis, Carl Broombaugh was part of those teams. And I figured since we were here, we should go visit my great-grandpa and great-grandma. And since I said that my great-grandpa was the uh, offensive lineman for, for Carl when he played at the high school in West Milton. But my, uh, my grandpa's brother is actually buried right beside him and he has a really fascinating story. So let's go visit them. Well, it's too cold for my grandpa to get out of here, but he stopped and told me the story of this guy. This was actually his, uh, his great uncle, Forrest Cress, and he said, he's got a fascinating story. And he starts telling me and I said, all right, let me get out. I got to tell this story. He said that Forrest Cress was a Chrysler representative in Japan before the war broke out. And he said, when the war broke out, he was over there working and they ended up putting him in a concentration camp. And he said that he was in there for five years. Everyone around him died, but he said somehow Forrest had snuck in some vitamins or something that had kept him alive. And he said that he, when he was finally released, he weighed 90 pounds. And he said that he actually, you can tell right here, lived to be over 100 years old. How about that? 104, what a life. Now my grandpa actually just added a little bit more to the Forest Crest story. He said that um, my his sister, Lois, had actually went out to San Francisco where Forrest was living later on in his life and visited him and said that he was sharp as a tack. All the way up until then, he remembered everything throughout his life and said he was a real interesting character to talk to. Now we're looking for my great-grandpa and great-grandma. Well, right here they are. Mabel and Edwin. 
they were a real, real interesting group. From the time that I was real little, my grandma was very meticulous. She, everything in her house was perfectly fixed. Everything, she ran everything like a tight ship. And uh, my grandpa just kind of, just kind of fall, fell in line with it. He was a farmer that my grandpa said was strong as an ox and always was out there working taught them a lot of things and he said he said actually my grandpa said you know we grew up with a uh, an outhouse for a few years of our life and I said really he said well everybody had them then he said it was actually grandpa that was one of the first people in the area to put in a working toilet but I remember uh, going and visiting him when he was in the old age home and he used to always have a have walnuts and he would always give me a walnut to take home and I remember one of the funny stories out of our family is that one of their wedding anniversaries when he was in the nursing home and was I think his mind was a little bit getting a little slippery they were there doing they were there celebrating the whole family was there and grandma was telling him what to do as always he looked up at her and said I think it's time we get a divorce I think maybe we should go our separate ways and she said Edwin don't say that in front of the children we always thought get a laugh out of that one now his son is my grandpa, the one that you guys have met, but he also had two other sons, Kermit and Lowell. And Lowell was my grandpa's older brother. Lowell was a bomber in World War II, bombing pilot. Now Kermit is right here, and Kermit was a career military man. This is uh, my Uncle Kermit. And Uncle Kermit has a really fascinating story too because he was a transport pilot from the Korean War to the Vietnam War. And my grandpa said he didn't actually make it overseas during Korea, but he was a 20 year serving uh, vet. So when Vietnam came in, he became, um, who was it, uh, General Westmoreland's personal pilot. So. <clears throat> General Westmoreland was pretty huge in the Vietnam War, most of you probably remember. So Kermit would have taken him to all the meetings that he had, everything that he did, and at one point, he loaned my Uncle Kermit off to Bob Hope. And so Bob Hope had uh, Uncle Kermit as his pilot for a while, taking him around, and he actually mentioned, Bob Hope mentioned Kermit in one of his books. Now my grandpa was also telling me there for a while, Stephanie Powers, the actress, was flying around and she was Kermit's co-pilot and said that Kermit's wife wasn't too proud of that or wasn't too happy with that. But one of the other interesting things that I never knew about my Uncle Kermit that my grandpa actually told me yesterday, he said, did you know, he said, I don't think I ever told you, Uncle Kermit was the man who flew the remains of Dwight D. Eisenhower to his final resting place when he passed away. He said his son accompanied them on the plane and Uncle Kermit took Dwight D. Eisenhower to where he's laid at rest now. Everybody's a Buckeyes fan. Everybody. Look at this headstone. I don't know who it is, but there's a number 64. There's a SpongeBob. I don't know, maybe it was a kid that was a... I don't know, I don't know what the story is. I'm sure one of you will look it up and find out. When Kermit was taking Bob Hope around, he said they actually got fired upon by a rifle and bullet came pretty close to Bob Hope and his, his crew's head. We just saw a sign for a community of nativity displays, so we figured we should pop in here and take a look. It's actually in this building. Well, let's take a look at this. It's pretty cool. When we came in here, they were kind of explaining the history of the estate here, and they basically said that the family that owned it left it to the church and wanted there to be nativity scenes. So every year they get about 15 nativity scenes from the University of Dayton, and they're made all over the world. They're ceramic, and they get different ones every year, and said that uh, we're free to walk around. They have about 15, so we'll go take a look. And you'll notice all the uh, different interpretations to each one also. That one's all wood carving from Madagascar. Oh, take a look at that. That's what he said. He goes all around. Look at that. That's great. Oh, look at that one. That is great. I love the different styles. This one's from India. How about that? 
Oh, look at that. From India as well. Oh, look at this one. This one's from France. Look at how they depicted all the uh, the clothing and wow, that is different. And Jesus has a full head of hair from Switzerland. What did he do? He was a businessman. They had a number of different business interests and things. So uh, I see the. Oh, take a look at that. Also from Switzerland. You see that? They're all like little crocheted stars and dolls and they almost look like Cabbage Patch dolls to an extent. That one's from Peru. Wow. This one was made in Alaska. And this is the last one we're gonna see. From Guatemala, look at that. All the little wood carved details. Go say hi. Hi, Ellie Mae. Nope, she didn't want any part of him today. Well, here we are, the most famous eatery in Troy, Ohio. Pretty much whenever a president or vice president or anybody comes into town, Actually, when I was, I think I was in elementary school, Dan Quayle came here, that was a big deal. But this is always kind of one of those places that everybody comes to when they're in Troy. And I told my grandpa, we gotta come here. So we picked up my mom and we're gonna go to Kay's today. There's an old Kay's shirt. And it hasn't changed since my mom was in school. So let's order some food. The battery's about to die, guys. Look at that old classic sign. They've even painted around it so they didn't have to ruin it. All right, I got it. These are some of the greasiest burgers you'll ever have, but they're amazing and the best. I got a Boston cream pie because it's my favorite and I can't find it in LA, and some breaded cauliflower. Let's do this. And there is the original. Like my grandpa said, that's inflation for you. We paid three bucks. See right there, it says 70 years. And the lady that's working here just told me that the uh, the one I just showed you was actually the police department across the street. That's where it was. Right up there. It originally started there until they moved right here. And this is where we're at today. So the original little box case that I showed you, that brick kind of square, it originally stood right there. Then once it was gone, my mom said it was a car dealership and now it's the Troy Police Department. Great meal, once again, thank you Kay's. Well, I got my Kay's hamburger fixed and now we're heading back home. I'm actually going down to Dayton tonight to meet up with somebody and we're gonna go, I think, to a place that I used to go to when I was a kid called the Spaghetti Warehouse. Well, speaking of uh, crossing cables, we're actually gonna go eat at a place called the Spaghetti Warehouse. I used to go here when I was a kid with my dad. Actually, pretty much everybody in my family's brought me here at one point. There we are. Let's go. Oh, check it out. There's the caboose in there. We got the trolley. All right, the classic fettuccine alfredo with chicken. Oh, nice. That's awesome, that old Wright Brothers sign up there. Classic. And then these are all Saturday evening post. We're about to enter Carillon Park and they do a pretty interesting Christmas display, I was told, so we decided to come over here and check it out. Wow, that thing is massive. I'm gonna walk up this hill and uh, I wanna get inside that thing and look up, see what it looks like inside. We were looking at this and I thought that was an elevator in there, but it looks like there's, there are bells at the very top. Very 
All right. Well, this is a little bit tough to see, but I wanted to come up here and show you guys because this is something that they actually have here in Dayton that they call Frankenstein's Castle or the Witch's Castle. And it has a kind of a weird ghost story kind of um, aspect to it because apparently they have quite a bit of problem with um, people coming up here and trying to break in. So they've actually, um, I'm not even sure how you get in. Maybe I'll kind of hard to see but they have some metal railing and stuff up there since it's snowy I almost can't climb the hill but the story was that uh, a bunch of teenagers apparently were up here playing around they said one night when lightning struck and it hit the um, the metal railing that goes up the staircase and they said that it actually electrocuted two of the kids and what they actually claim is that on nights where there's lightning when it hits up here you can actually see a silhouette of the two children that were killed up here. And they said it pretty much only happens, like it, like I said, it's kind of one of those weird ghost stories that it only happens when it's, um, when it's lightning out. So let me see if I can get up there. They don't really have much parking up here, so my friend had to park her car so I could do this. They also call this sometimes the witch's castle. And uh, if I can't show you too much, I may, um, I may go ahead and just see if I can find a picture online. There. Hold on, let me get my phone out and hit it with some light here. There it is. Pretty creepy. And there's actually a stairwell in there, but they have the uh, the front door over here is completely boarded up and everything, so can't really see it, but inside there I can see the, the railing of the railing that they talked about. So we're gonna go ahead and get out of here, but nobody really seems to know what exactly this was. The rumor is that it was a possibly a watch out tower for the Carillon family who owned this section of, of the park that's now a golf course and everything. But nobody really seems to know exactly what this was for, but they've always called it Frankenstein's Tower. This is pretty awesome. Haley's showing me all kinds of like sections of Dayton that I actually haven't been to before. I had never been to Carillon Park. I'd never seen this great statue here to John Patterson. Look at that. I live for stuff like this. Look at that, he's kind of like, hey, I know that guy, shadow person. Look at that, he's kind of behind like the mechanism of a wheel. Pretty neat, right up here at the top of, basically the top of Patterson, hence, Hence the name of the street and the statue, right? And of course you probably guessed that the reason they put this here was because he was an avid lover of Dayton and supporter of Dayton and left this entire property and this entire parkland to the city of Dayton. So they honored him. They have a little, little piece about it right there. If I was the cook, I'd never understood. In fact, I know I would